This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. I'm going to take you on a brief pictorial tour, and then we'll look at statistics on a different type of tour. And uh, first of all, uh, let's simply uh, state what I think to be a fact, which is uh, that in the human line of descent, as this relatively recent cave art shows, uh, we have been prone to fighting uh, in this case with bows and arrows, but earlier with other tools or weapons. Uh, this is simply a graphic uh, representation of what you saw before, a little bit easier to look at. The subject matter does not date back into the Pleistocene epoch, which was when humans were not depicting their own conflicts, but mainly animals. Uh, but because the animals were often dangerous, this was another form of conflict with similar use of weapons. Uh, this shows that uh, hunting large game was conflictual as opposed to simply going out and killing the poor animals with an incredibly effective weapon. Here we have a buffalo of sorts. A spear has uh, caused its entrails to protrude, so it's on the way to death. And the human hunter, uh, assuming it's human, it sort of looks like it has a bird's head. We can't really tell you what that means. Uh, but the human's lying down on the ground and looking reasonably prostrate. prostate. This is a spear that dates back to about 300,000 years ago. It was preserved in anaerobic soil. It may have been uh, uh, discovered in pr proximity to horses that uh, carried butchering marks. But at any rate, these javelins were extremely uh, well-fashioned, aerodynamic, well-balanced. So humans have been using extremely effective lethal weapons at long range for a long time. And the longer the range, of course, the more prone you are to fight because the risks are less. Uh, this is a rare picture of a human, uh, Mesolithic rather than earlier. And this person lying on the ground has been what we call pin cushioned, which means quite a few people shot arrows at the same person way beyond what was necessary to kill him. At uh, the Remigia cave in Spain, uh, there is a similar scene which shows the uh, poor guy lying on the ground with 10 arrows in him. And there are 10 archers who are holding their bows above their heads in a way that I would uh, venture to interpret as looking exultant, uh, or at least happy with the outcome. And my guess uh, would be that this is an execution, not a warfare act. And uh, according to my data, the main reason for capital punishment among today's foragers is that somebody acts the bully, is too aggressive, tries to boss others around because they basically all hunter-gatherers uh, of this type live in egalitarian societies. They don't tolerate uh, dominance among males within the group. Uh, the database we'll meet with shortly shows that uh, almost half of the capital punishment uh, episodes involve uh, anti-bullying uh, measures. Uh, other things that can get you in trouble are committing incest. Uh, you could 
perhaps endanger the whole group by breaking a supernatural sanction, or uh, you could uh, basically get in trouble for thievery or cheating. Uh, here we have Australian Aborigines armed with spears, well-armed people. Only in Australia did hunter-gatherers fail to invent the bow, but they did invent boomerangs, which gave them a rather effective weapon for long-distance uh, combat. And of course, hunter-gatherers go around armed everywhere. So if a conflict arises between people, they're quite well prepared to kill one another. This would be the males. And it makes human male aggression particularly dangerous. I've just thrown this in because it's uh, such an unusual picture. It actually shows hunter-gatherers involved in a conflict. In this case, uh, the men are quarreling over someone's disobedience to indigenous law, and nobody's actually getting hurt. But it's a rare picture, and it, it does show that it's the males who are uh, talking things over in a heated terms. And this is an artist's re rendition of Australian Aboriginal uh, fighting, presumably between groups. Note the spears and boomerangs, which are also used in hunting, uh, which returns us to that theme that hunting weapons make human uh, aggression particularly lethal. However, they're also using shields, and they are uh, an artifact that is designed just for interhuman combat. Also note that the woman and child are cowering in the hut. This is strictly a male affair, and it tends to be strictly a male. The females may be victims, but they're uh, not likely to be involved in the fighting. There are no actual photographs of hunter-gatherer warfare, but these same people in Australia often go to war with neighboring groups, and Australian rock art shows intergroup conflict going back for 10,000 years, although it intensifies around 6,000 years ago. Uh, we're now going to make a rather abrupt transition from pretty pictures to a bunch of statistics. Uh, Paleolithic archaeology provides only a few hints about the expression of male violence if we want to go back far beyond the Holocene into the Pleistocene. However, uh, there is another avenue which I'm exploring, which would be to use contemporary hunter-gatherers as prehistoric exemplars for the late Pleistocene. The problem is taking care to choose the right hunter-gatherers. And this can take us back to about 100,000 years ago, or whenever it was uh, still debated, when humans became culturally as well as anatomically modern. So which hunter-gatherers today are the best models for what was happening much earlier? Uh, there are about 400 hunting societies that have been studied ethnographically. Of these, approximately half I can qualify as exemplars for the anatomically and culturally modern humans who emerged somewhere around 100,000 years ago. Uh, these late Pleistocene appropriate societies, as I call them, live independently of domestication, they're not heavily involved with modern economies or polities, and they may number as high as 200 out of the 400 total that anthropologists have written field reports about. Over the past decade and a half at USC, I've been developing a specialized database which is dedicated to reconstructing behaviors of culturally modern human hunter-gatherers in the late Pleistocene. There are about a total of maybe 180 to 200 foraging societies that are appropriate. And there are somewhere between one and maybe a dozen field reports for each of these societies. So it's been quite a huge effort to get uh, this information into shape where uh, people can uh, easily uh, retrieve data and look for patterns. Uh, my project focuses partly because of my own interests on socio-political behavior, also partly because there's so much interest in uh, socio-political behavior, themes like warfare, altruism, and so forth. And what we do is apply a standard detailed coding protocol to each field report so the information will be readily available. And I'm throwing this table at you just to show how much data there is. Uh, the data analysis here is uh, preliminary. In other words, I'm just looking at some very gross trends because that's as far as I've gotten in analyzing the data on conflict. And basically what the data show are, or is, how many times a given coded behavior is mentioned in field reports for each culture area where foragers have lived over the past several centuries. 
For instance, if you look at the main headings, feuding, raiding, and warfare are found in all world areas among certain hunter-gatherers, even though these behaviors are not necessarily universal or even widespread within a given culture area. So that's why I say that it's, this is a crude uh, preliminary analysis. Uh, one of the things that drives intergroup conflict, although there's plenty of conflict within groups among hunter-gatherers, but intergroup conflict is ethnocentrism. Uh, this is a cultural universal. Most ethnographies report that hunter-gatherers call themselves the people. We are the people. Other people are mm, not quite people. And uh, it's a rather nasty aspect of being a human. Uh, we all experience it in some form or other, I'm sure, uh, although we may not want to admit it to ourselves even. And uh, here we see that uh, North America fails to report it, but I think that's a vagary of my database uh, since I have had a really hard time getting a large number of uh, cultures that represent North America simply because uh, most of them uh, m got mounted uh, for hunting as with the Plains Indians or they, you know, the Northwest Coast, they had protracted uh, sedentarism and social classes developed and so forth and so on. So uh, we uh, have a, 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 what amounts to a gap here, I think, due to ethnographic reporting rather than to a lack of ethnocentrism since I think everyone agrees that all humans have, have a potential for ethnocentrism that tends to be brought out when they live in adjacent groups. Uh, here is uh, something I've always been very interested in, which is feuding. Within groups, all male foragers are pr prone to take blood revenge for the death of a kinsman. This is pretty much a uh, given fact. And it also applies uh, to between group uh, conflicts where someone gets killed and this doesn't, it doesn't really matter whether the other group is similar culturally to one's own or it's uh, culturally different, but retaliatory killing seems to be very deep in human uh, nature, as it were. And chimpanzees retaliate as individuals, but not as groups. So this is, humans have taken it to a new level. Sometimes a single killing ends the conflict but sometimes a chain of killings results. Thus, feuding can become involved with raiding and even warfare, which we'll now talk about. With respect to raiding, another widespread pattern of male violence uh, involves sneaky little attacks where you try to go in and do some damage and get out with getting, without getting hurt. Uh, you keep the imbalance of power, not through numbers, but through surprise. And, uh, the object is to use surprises to very quickly do damage and then retreat without incurring any casualties at all. A raid is a major failure if anybody gets killed. Raids may have revenge motives or they may be to take away natural resources, women, or trophies from enemies. And as you can see, uh, among our uh, sample of 58 cultures, that's how many I've now processed, uh, with geographic distribution as possible because some areas uh, have very few cultures, some have a lot. We see that uh, raiding is widespread, uh, that raiding for trophies seems to be uh, very widespread. Raiding for women seems to be universal among hunter-gatherers, and that revenge motives often get involved with raiding. So a raiding can be simply to go get even, or it can get, be to get stuff, as it were. Uh, now we come to warfare. War is a loaded topic for people that are interested in or not interested in evolution, respectively. And the question of prehistoric warfare engenders all kinds of philosophical debate, but here we're just here to look at the facts, uh, and that perhaps uh, is a decep deceptive statement since I obviously have an opinion about warfare. I happen to think it goes back fairly far into prehistory, uh, but not universally necessarily. In coding for warfare, I have defined any conflict between groups that rises above the level of feuding or raiding as warfare, which gets me nicely out of the problem of defining warfare, uh, which is a complex problem indeed. Genocidally motivated surprise attacks appear uh, at least once in five of the six culture areas. 
So serious warfare is widespread, if far from being universal among human foragers today. When I say far from being universal, I mean that although it may be represented uh, in five and probably six of the culture areas, just uh, due to, again, my problem with the vagaries of ethnographic reporting, uh, it's maybe universal, but it doesn't mean that everybody does it. It means if you go to any culture area in the world, some hunter-gatherers uh, had something that escalated above feuding and raiding in which I'm calling warfare. Uh, if we consider the possibilities for this pattern as of 100,000 years ago, we must also consider the fact that climates then were far less stable. Indeed, Pleistocene junctures involving serious natural resource scarcity would have been quite frequent, and often hunter-gatherers would have been seriously marginalized by other hunter-gatherers, presumably with cooperation and fighting, competing as possible adaptive strategies to cope with that. So people don't always fight. Sometimes they cooperate with neighbors, but they also seem to fight on every continent. At least a few of them do. Um, here's another uh, interesting fact about uh, in looking at these gross patterns. There are customs by which humans reduce the casualties in conflict, uh, sort of like rules of the game. Uh, they actually line up sometimes. Uh, the, there's actually ethnographic film on this in New Guinea, which of course is uh, Holocene people. But Pleistocene people may well have done it since contemporary hunter-gatherers do it uh, in quite a few places, although not everywhere. But everybody lines up, uh, shouts imprecations and taunts and threats, and stay out of range, uh, effective range, and only a few of them get killed. Uh, there's also the possibility that two individuals will fight representing their respective groups. Uh, if we're interested in male aggression, uh, we're also interested in conflict resolution between groups. And uh, along with the propensity for male violence comes a tendency to manage conflicts or pacify them, probably just as deep a tendency in human nature. Foraging groups that fight also negotiate their problems directly or with the help of third parties. They also create truces, which may lead to formal peace meetings, sometimes with payment of compensation or a prisoner exchange. All of these patterns were seen in the agricultural tribal people who followed, and their warfare rates would appear to be much higher, but hunter-gatherers apparently invented this. Uh, finally, war outcomes, what happens when you fight? Uh, the consequences of small-scale warfare are various. A conflict may continue indefinitely, particularly if it's feeding off of revenge motives, but it also may just fade away on its own, or else one group may prudently move away. The tangible outcomes include both casualties and taking away the enemy's natural resources. If we look just at hunter, contemporary hunter-gatherers, the males invariably fight within their groups, and my data show that female aggression becomes lethal quite seldom. These foragers also fight between groups, which is what we've been speaking about, and warfare raiding and feuding are found all over the world, even though many foraging societies lack one or more of these patterns. I have emphasized the link between hunting and fighting with our own species, and it probably is no accident that only a few of today's foraging societies have female hunters and that males account for almost all the serious violence. There's a great deal to be, more to be learned from this developing database, and I hope to share it with you in the future. And I will talk just a minute about uh, future use of the database. Uh, to date, the database has been used for uh, publications and subjects like the indigenous promotion of altruistic behavior, supernatural sanctioning that becomes moral, capital punishment, and various types of moral deviance. And this presentation starts a new focus on male aggression as yet another important thing to understand about our immediate ancestors and the genetic nature and cultural habits they've handed down to us. Thank you. We're going to move from the micro to the uh, macro and look at human skeletal remains, which is what I study. I work in, just up the coast a few hours in the Santa Barbara Channel area. I've worked there my entire career, although I've gone other places as well. And um, 
that's a, it's a particularly uh, valuable area um, from the perspective of bioarchaeology, which is what I do studying human skeletal remains, because people practice burial for the entire time they occupied the area. And so we have human skeletal remains from about 7,500 years up until the historic period. So we can really do some interesting longitudinal studies. And that's sort of where I come into the study of uh, aggression and violence is filling in that gap for about the last 10,000 years in terms of what humans have been doing prior to European contact. In, a, in this case, in a hunter-gatherer, fisher society, tribal society. The Chumash who occupy, well, still do, <laughs> the, the Santa Barbara Channel area and have been there uh, for a long time were hunter-gatherer fishers. They built um, plank canoes and plied the waters of the Santa Barbara Channel area um, to trade with people on the islands. They went up and down the coast, including down this way. Um, they traded for steatite oyas from Catalina Island and uh, traded with people from the interior. So they had this very elaborate trade network and they fished from those tamales. They hunted sea mammals. They uh, lived in relatively large villages for hunter-gatherers. Um, they had a, a scribe status, um, hereditary status. They had a form of shell bead money that was made on the islands and used in the exchange of various types of uh, food goods and various other things. They made fabulous baskets that are extraordinary and uh, extremely valuable today. So these are the people I'm talking about. And um, I've looked at many things um, about these folks, but um, I'm gonna focus on the aggression and, and, and well, in particular, violence today. The, so the question is, um, we know that there was some evidence for violence at historic contact. Um, we have accounts of burned villages and um, head taking that was actually later in time. But the question is always, was this a product of European contact or something that happened very late? Or is there a longer history of violence? And this goes at this question of is violence a modern problem or is it something that is long standing? And so that again is where my research comes into this. And then if there is violence, what, what did it look like? Was it like uh, the uh, Donnie, which is that center photo up there um, in these kind of big skirmishes that they sometimes have? Um, they're not particularly deadly, but a lot of young men get involved in them and it's a chance to show off and sometimes people do get killed and you also assess the opposite side and that can lead to more serious things. Um, the, the little uh, diagram on the lower left-hand side was actually the, the revolt by the Chumash, so we know there was, uh, again, violence at historic contact. They had tamales, they had these ocean-going canoes. Did they actually fight with canoes? Well, a lot of these questions we really don't have answers for, but we do appeal to these modern or recent models to try and understand what was going on in the past, rather than just trying to kind of make stuff up. So we go back and forth between what we know about the present or historical and what we try to infer from limited remains that we have from the archeological record. In bioarchaeology, we're studying the human skeletal remains and what we have is the end product of violence. We have the bodies and the injuries that they have sustained. And so we start there and it's kind of like a forensic case and you work backwards to try and figure out um, who was fighting, what, were the, what was the context of fighting, and so forth. And so um, it can be a challenge, and you bring in, of course, other, other types of information as well in trying, to, um, in trying the, to do the reconstruction, but that's really what I'm doing. And in this case, this is a jolly man. He's been shot in the shoulder. He's being carried back home probably by his kinsman. If he dies, we, we might see that injury you know, down the line if he were buried. Um, if he lives, maybe they would get that out, or maybe they would get it out if he died. So we don't even always see the injuries in the bodies, only when they happen to stay in there or somehow affect the skeleton. So I think you can imagine that we're seeing an incomplete picture, but it's what we've got. Two types of injuries that we see in the Santa Barbara Channel area are um, depressed cranial vault fractures. Um, from clubbing implements and um, injuries. Those are primarily uh, healed and primarily uh, and, and seem to have some type of a sublethal intent. And then injuries um, associated with uh, uh, projectile weapons where the intent seems to be to uh, kill people. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. First of these are the healed depression fractures of the cranial vault. Um, these are some examples here, and you can see that they just kind of look like little divots in the skull. Um, when, they were first, um, uh, when they were first sustained, they would have had cracks around the margins, but the body has the capacity to heal, and so you just recognize them in that way. 
They occur all over the vault, but there is uh, definitely sort of a, a pattern that we see. What exactly caused these in this area? We don't know. We don't have any good weapons preserved. We know in, in an area slightly to the south that they did have these kind of stick clubs, but we've never really found anything, so it's not clear if there was some type of particular implement that was used or if it was more um, people, you know, kind of grabbing what might, uh, what might be around. These are war clubs, but from other areas. So if you look at the distribution on the cranial vault, you see that um, they are primarily located on the front of the head. Um, to some extent, you find them on the side and less commonly on the back, at least for these healed injuries. We do occasionally see some that have not healed um, the lethal injuries, but these are very uncommon and they seem to occur in distinct contexts. They are almost always are associated with a projectile injury. And so generally speaking, when they're sustaining these injuries that we find as healed injuries, it seems like they don't intend to kill. So it is a different type of, of violence. So when you look by sex at um, the distribution of these injuries, it's really the men who have a lot of the injuries to the forehead and not so much the women. Women have more equal number on the front and the side and then a lesser number um, in the back. So there seems to be something distinct between what's going on with women and what's going on with men. And men have far more than women do as well. And these are just some examples of these. So they're not huge. The biggest one is on the far, far upper far left-hand corner. Um, sometimes they're multiple, oftentimes they're a singular one, so it's, it's, it is a little bit puzzling exactly what's going on, but they clearly are in the front of the face, often they are on the left-hand side, although that doesn't really show up in here, which happens when you strike out, uh, a right-handed person strikes out with the person facing them. If you look at the distribution across age categories, um, you, what you can see is that um, up until about 10 years, we, I, I really didn't record any in, in, um, in, in, in folks uh, younger than 10 years. Then from about 10 to 18, you start to see these. You can't really determine the sex of people until they start to reach sexual maturity. So most of those people in that 10 to 18 have not had sex determined for them. Um, and uh, that little diamond just shows the value that I have for the people of that age group. You notice that it falls right on the trajectory of males, and I suspect that those are male injuries and not female injuries. The couple that I do know the sex of are male. And then um, in the 18 to 25, we really see a, a big increase, particularly in males all across the age categories. It's males have a higher frequency than females. Now, this is a death assemblage, and so you have to understand that when you look at these different age categories, these are the people who, who died at a particular age group, it's, and anyone who is in an older age group was also of that younger age. But, um, so, and, and these injuries heal. And so the people who have them in the older age category didn't necessarily get them in at 25 to 40. They may have gotten them at a younger age, and, um, and they just sustain them, and they're dying of other things. So what, in, in some, what this really shows is that people are getting these injuries from about 10 to 25 years old, at least men are. And then by the time they're about um, 25, most people have sustained the injuries. And there might be a few more, but for the most part, that's the age at which they've gotten them quite young, especially men. Women have far less of them. And the interesting thing about that greater than 40 for women is that, again, because these accrue, and, um, the lower frequency in this older age group suggests that if you manage to stay out of those types of activities where you're getting injuries, you live longer. Not a stunning, uh, <laughs> stunning uh, discovery. I just wanted to pull this in really quickly but I, I, to show you that we are, uh, when you do what I do, you're constantly going between clinical literature and other types of literature to try and understand things. This was a study I just pulled off the web a couple days ago. Just to, it was a study of non-fatal head injury in Scottish youth, and not surprisingly, once again, a young men have uh, more than a young women. More young women's rates are are, are more even. Male rates are high from 15 to uh, 24 years old, and then they start to decline. So it's actually a very similar sort of thing in a very uh, different context. Um, I think showing that, that for, at least from my perspective, there are such commonalities, whether you're looking you know, 2,000 years ago or you're looking uh, today. So what's going on? Well, Phil Walker and I have invoked the Yanomamo club fights as a possible model for what we see in these uh, men in uh, the Chumash society, in ancient Chumash society. Among the Yanomamo, uh, all, all guys have these long uh, clubs, and they use them to resolve disputes when uh, relationships uh, are important and you don't want something to escalate to uh, death because that can, can start a feuding cycle and so forth. And at least traditionally, they were fairly common. You might have visitors over in your village, and something happens, and you try to resolve something by hitting each other on the head. It's a chance to show that you're brave, and the scars are things that people are proud of. This is actually a fight between a father and a son, so it shows you that these things happen, can, can happen in quite intimate contexts, although I don't know how common that one is. 
And then there's the, the scars down in the lower left-hand side of a man who's had been involved in a, lump, a number of uh, club fights over the course of his life. Now, the animal will practice cremation, and so I don't know what, how, much, how often those scars actually impact the skull, and so it's hard to say how this might be a model for the Chumash and how, you know, having one or two scars, could that really be the result of this type of a thing? But in any event, maybe something like this. If you look across time, they occur in all time periods. Um, this is a very crude kind of uh, temporal uh, chart, but um, uh, what you can see is that men have more than women in all time periods, but they particularly peak right in the middle there with that 33.3% for males in a period we call the early middle period. And that increase really does suggest that something becomes more institutionalized at that time. Their population is growing. People are certainly fairly sedentary fairly early on in this area, so we may see uh, more disputes uh, happening and people attempting to resolve them in this sublethal way. And this is interesting because in the next time period, there's going to be a shift and lethal violence is really going going to peak. So projectile injuries are injuries uh, caused by spears, um, darts, arrow points, usually stone in this area. They um, sometimes embed in bone. Uh, sometimes you find rec you have excavation records describing points in the body. And um, I tend to include them all when I'm trying to reconstruct this more lethal form of violence. If you look at the distribution of these injuries um, in, the, in the body, um, they are most common in the thoracic cavity and in the abdominal cavity, also some in the head and neck, and I don't find too many in the, um, in the upper limbs or um, lower limbs. And keeping in mind that this is a death assemblage, that's probably not um, entirely um, surprising um, to have this focus on thoracic and abdominal. There was a, a, a paper written in the 1800s by a surgeon who treated people in the American Indian Wars, and recorded uh, the most lethal injuries as being those to the thorax and the abdomen. And that's, again, I think that's kind of self-evident because that's where, the, uh, that's where the organs are. And we, in a death assemblage, you're looking at people who died of things, and most of these injuries are not healed. So um, all this is, is not surprising, but it does make it a little more challenging in terms of trying to understand everybody who might have been injured because we have a bias towards those who did not uh, survive their injuries. So if you look at the, um, at the uh, distribution of these injuries across um, different age uh, categories, um, there aren't any injuries up until about 10 years of age, so children seem to have been uh, protected from this type of violence. From 10 to 18, you start to see some injuries, but this isn't in all time periods. This is really only in um, a, a certain time period that we start to see people injured in that age category. And then beginning in about 18 to 25, there's a real um, peak in injuries, um, particularly, again, in young men. Um, now, again, this is a death assemblage, so this isn't an assessment of risk. This is only an assessment of what, how many people died in each age category, because the people who are in older age categories, they also were 18 to 25, but they went on to live other things. It's a little complicated when you're trying to interpret skeletal data, because it's not a living population. It's a death assemblage, and so you have to look at it differently, and it's easy to make uh, mistakes in your interpretations. But in any event, as a cause of death, it was an important one for 18 to 25-year-olds and probably younger, 10 to 18, probably young men, given that most of these injuries are young men. And then um, by the time you get to 25 to 40, some of those injuries at least are healed and probably were, uh, uh, were sustained when they were younger in the 18 to 25, so that would probably add some additional people. So I guess my point here is that the, the age of, of injuries, probably 18 to 25, maybe 30, uh, is the primary age for, for men. Women um, do not have as many injuries and they don't have uh, quite that same pattern. They seem to be a little bit less protected, perhaps, as they get older, and that might imply that there are other types of, of violence going on um, there. And I just show this slide, once again, when you're doing these kind of studies, you want to go between, you want to keep yourself um, calibrated onto what's actually going on and be realistic. And when you do a search, which I did just the other day, um, and looking at, uh, at, at violence, male violence, um, you, you pick up the same kind of images. People maybe look a slightly different, but um, it's young men in all these different contexts, Papua New Guinea, or uh, Pakistan, or the Ukraine, or Rwanda, or Sudan. And so it's not really different what I'm seeing in the Santa Barbara Channel area. And again, I think that's important because sometimes we might think that things are really different in the past or that something that's going on now isn't reflective of a broader sort of history. And what I find is that the patterns are, um, are quite similar. If you look across time, um, again, you can see that um, men have um, 
most of the injuries um, and have higher levels of injuries in all time periods. And it looks as though in many time periods there weren't very many um, injuries, at least relative to one time period. But I think it's important to remember that those, that's like 3% of men, that's 3 out of 100, or 4.9 is 5 out of 100. So even at those seemingly low levels, this is, well, it's, it's, a, it's a significant thing that's going on. I, I wouldn't say that it's the main thing that, that people are, are, are focusing on or that it's the primary thing that's going on in people's life. But it seems to have, be a component of, of, of what's going on throughout this prehistoric sequence of 7,500 years. But there is a really interesting um, peak that happens about 700 to 1300 AD, and that's just, this is a period that I've gotten really interested in. It's not that male violence, you know, anything shifts there. There's still males have more than females, but there's a lot more altogether. And as male violence goes up, female violence goes up too. And uh, this is something, another sort of uh, uh, aspect that I've been really interested in is what are the contexts in which violence occurs, as we can see in a longitudinal record, and this is actually the value of the archaeological record, is that we do have this longitudinal perspective. And um, what, what one thing that seems to be occurring, well, okay, there's a number of things. One thing is population's getting bigger. The population's getting more sedentary. They seem to be getting more territorial, according to work by uh, Doug Kennett. But the other thing that's going on seems to be climate. And there's pretty good climatic reconstructions for California and um, one not far from uh, the area that I work in, and they suggest that there were a couple of pretty severe droughts. This actually, this whole time period is called the medieval climatic anomaly. It was a period of climatic warming. It was a period of unstable climatic conditions, which we may hear about later from Carol Ember, um, as being something that is, um, uh, can um, be associated with um, warfare. And then there were a couple of um, very severe droughts. And uh, um, so if you look at the chart, the um, yellow dots are, uh, show you the projectile violence, which is the lethal violence. And they really seem to peak um, during that period, actually fa fairly strongly correlated with these really severe droughts. And so um, I think this is pretty strong evidence that in terms of context for violence, when people are uh, competing, probably in this case for well-watered areas, this is Southern California, as I'm sure you all know, water is a crucial resource and it's something that people are, I, I, know, it, I know this is on your mind now, well, this isn't the first time that this has happened. And you know, a thousand years ago or 800 years ago it happened and it had some pretty, uh, pretty dire consequences as people, I think, fought for these few well-watered uh, places that um, existed on the landscape. So, just in sum, I think what we can take away from these archaeological data is um, that we see the same kinds of patterning in both sublethal and lethal violence that you see today. It's, it's, it's men, it's young men, and the fact that everywhere you look in the past and in the present, uh, you see the same kind of patterning does, select, does suggest um, evolutionary underpinnings of a sort. But there is more to the explanation than that, and I think that there, there's also conditions under which you're gonna see these kind of behaviors come out. And in the Santa Barbara Channel area, that behavior is manifested in, in times of drought when water resources are scarce and food resources are scarce. And so these are just two elements of the equation of understanding warfare that um, someone like me can contribute to in uh, studying human skeletal remains from archeological sites. Thank you. It's nice to be back again. I was a student at the Salk Institute 35 years ago. All right, good afternoon. Today I would like to talk about lethal violence in two hunter-gatherer societies that I worked in. I will start with some real life examples that I recorded during the last 35 years, but my goal here is to do more than present anecdotes. What I'd like to do is suggest some statistical comparative patterns and then perhaps some unique patterns of violence that set humans apart from other mammals and perhaps even all other organisms on Earth. This first slide gives an example of this. Humans are the only species to signal clearly that other mem to the other members of their own social group that they have killed an individual. They communicate this effectively to a wide audience of people who were nowhere near the killing event when it happened and I believe that the potential for large audience effects affects human violence patterns quite considerably. 
Here, for example, we see the ritual jai cha scars that are put on the back of all Ache men after they have killed another human being. In January 2012, the Washington Post announced that a Machiganga man in Peru named Chaco Flores had been killed by an uncontacted tribe of Mashkopito Indians. Chaco was shot in the chest by a bamboo-tipped arrow when he encountered the Mashkopito close to his village in the jungle. The Mashkopito are a nomadic tribe of hunter-gatherers who still use stone tools. They're one of the last uncontacted tribes in the world. And these photos were taken in 2012 by an ornithologist who spied on the Mashkopito with a huge telephoto lens from across the Madre de Dios River. What really grabbed my attention about this news story in the Washington Post is that I myself had tracked the Mashkopito between 1983 and 1986 with grant money from the LSB Leakey Foundation. Chaco, whose real name is Shamoklo, was my guide at that time, and he and I had approached to within 40 meters of a Mashkopito camp in 1986 and lay there in the underbrush listening to women talking and children playing before we decided to withdraw because it was uncertain if an attempted contact would be peaceful. There's also another uncontacted group of people, another tribe in the same region around the border of Peru and Brazil. These people call themselves Nawa, and they have been photographed recently several times out of the window of low-flying aircraft. You can see from these pictures here that they generally fire arrows at the monster buzzing bee as it passes overhead. The most recent pictures, which were just posted on the internet a couple weeks ago, were taken in March of this year, only two months ago, in an overflight that was contracted by a neighboring indigenous tribe that was concerned about lethal raids by the Nawa on their village. Ironically, I also worked with these newly contacted Yorta Nawa in 1986. And what was particularly strange was that Chaco was my guide at that time too, and he had told me matter-of-factly how the Yorta had attacked his own village when he was a boy and slaughtered every man, woman, and child. Chaco was the only survivor of that attack. His sister was left with a stake through the center of her body in the middle of the village, and Chaco had escaped by jumping into the Manu River, drifting underwater downstream as the Yorta shot arrows at him from the banks around. Well, the story of Chaco Flores and the uncontracted Mascopito illustrate a grim fact of small-scale tribal society. Men from different tribes often kill each other on sight and conduct wars of extermination. In order to study the adaptive significance of human lethal violence, however, we systematically collect detailed information about the lives of individuals, and I did this for two hunter-gatherer tribes in South America throughout the 1980s. First, the Ache of Paraguay, and second, the Hiwi of Venezuela. Both of these two groups made first peaceful outside contact in the 1970s, but the Hiwi continued to raid each other and outsiders up through the middle of the 1990s. From 1980 to 1996, my colleagues and I collected hundreds of interviews with all living men and women in three Ache and two Hiwi communities. We asked people to recount all the births and deaths of close relatives one by one, starting with their grandparents and then moving to nieces, nephews, children, grandchildren, and so on. From these interviews, we collected details on 317 intentionally caused violent deaths and 68 other individuals who were captured in warfare and never seen again. At the end of my talk, I'm going to present some comparative statistical measures, but first I'd like to just do a survey of the types of killing that were reported to us. Photos in these PowerPoint slides that I'm about to show are of the actual killers or the individual who narrated the event to us. The victim photos, however, are people who are described as the same age and sex as the real victim. Names of currently living individuals have been deleted to protect identities, but the real names are given for deceased individuals. So the first category that we recorded were infanticides, children between zero and one years old, and this accounted for 93 of the deaths in our sample. 
For example, and I'm just going to go through one example of each type here. We don't have time to look at everything. In 1984, uh, K gave birth to a small baby girl in the forest, and then later, um, approximately three or four days later, she smothered that baby to death. She told us that she was concerned that the baby's head was perhaps not correctly formed, and in any case, her husband was angry at her because he claimed she had had sex with other men around the time of the baby's conception. Second category of killing is child homicide. Children two to 14 years old totaled 45 deaths in our sample. D, for example, here, told us how he and his friend A had killed the girl Kanjegi a 12-year-old girl in 1962 because her father, Bechepegi, had been slain in a club fight, the same kind we just heard Patricia talk about. Kanjegi had tried to run, but the older men easily caught her. They held her down, stepped on her chest until she lost consciousness, and then buried her alive with her father, Bechepegi. The next category is geronticide and euthanasia, accounting for about 10 of the deaths in our sample. For example, my friend Kwaregi here told me tearfully how he had buried his mother Pudombutugi alive in 1972 when she was too sick to walk. She had been left behind when the band moved to a new campsite, and Kwaregi returned to look for her. He found her too weak to stand and decided to bury her alive so that vultures would not peck out her eyes while she was still alive. Piragi, on the other hand, was quite joyful as he told me how he got his nickname Brupiaregi, which means the killer. He mentioned that he had killed several old women in his group when they were too old to keep up with the band. He always waited until they were sitting, facing away from him, and then snuck up behind them, hit them with the blunt side of an ax on the back of the head or the neck. They all died instantly. Next category in our sample is, of intentional killing is suicide. Interestingly, we had eight cases of suicide. Nutsia, for example, here, told me how her father, Moreite, had killed himself in 1941 by drinking poison water that had been left standing in a palo aceite tree when it was cut down for a new canoe. All of the Hiwi know that such water is poisonous, but Moreite did not want to live any longer because his wife had recently left him. Among the Ache here, an old man, Kuruwachugi, who was around 70 years old, became weak and sick with diarrhea. As the band was moving through the forest and found tracks of a nearby enemy camp, Kuruwachugi simply walked intentionally into the enemy camp and was never seen again. Next category of deaths in our sample is spousal homicide, which accounted for five cases. Uh, this Hiwi man right here, Wahaito, described to me how he had shot Pelchemo, his 17-year-old second wife, to death with an arrow because his first wife, R, did not want him to take a co-wife. Among the Ache, on the other hand, Kanje Puchogi here had speared his wife with an unstrung bow in 1947. After her death, he lived as a bachelor for the rest of his life and was never able to find another woman that was willing to marry him. <laughs> The next category in our sample is homicide. We had 11 deaths from this. For example, C here told me how his uncle Garagi had been shot by a man named Tonangi while Garagi was fishing. Tonangi had snuck up behind Garagi and shot him in the back with an arrow. Garagi then fell into the lagoon and drowned. Unfortunately, Garagi had no male kin to avenge his death. On the other hand, D here, who was one of my best informants among the modern Hiwi, told me how he and a few of his friends had encountered a man named Jay on a trail near the Apure River in 1981 and stabbed the man to death. Jay was then cut up into little pieces, thrown into the river full of piranhas and alligators, which quickly devoured all evidence of the killing. They hoped that this would go undiscovered, but it was not. Jay had been attempting to elicit surreptitious copulation with Dee's wife against her will, and she had informed her husband of the fact. The killing was, in fact, eventually discovered, and this led to three or four years of intervillage raiding before they finally made a peace. 
The next category, which follows almost directly from Patricia's talk, is what I call ritual deaths or ritual duels. This accounted for nine deaths in our sample. The Ache men often invited other bands for ritual club fight battles during the entire pre-contact period. This happened about once a year um, in Ache society. Several Ache men were witnesses, for example, in 1969 when a young man, Betapagi, who was only 19 years old, was clubbed to death by Bejarogi, Achipurangi, and Nambugi. Although the fight had started as a two-man duel, with hardwood clubs, it quickly escalated into a contest of one against three as others joined into the fray. The next category of deaths is intra-tribal warfare or within group warfare. Uh, sometimes we might call this feuding as well as Chris Bohm mentioned. In this case, I had four deaths among the Hiwi. In 1986, Mehure here, who was 31 years old, was killed by a coalition of men who had fought against and killed his father some 30 years earlier. While Mahorde was visiting a neighboring band and taking hallucinogenic drugs, Cayetano, a really old guy here who had been involved in the killing of Mahorde's father, approached Mahorde and hit him on the head with an ax. Then as Mahorde sat dizzy and vomiting, several other men shot him full of arrows to finish him off the famous pincushion that we heard about earlier. Mehurde's body was dragged into the savanna and mutilated. Several days later, when men from his village discovered the body, they conducted a raid on the offending village. This led to raids and counter raids that took place over a period of four or five years while we were in the field. One raid took place when my colleague, Dr. Magdalena Hurtado, was in the Mahenemutu camp and I was out hunting with uh, my focal man in March of 1988. Magdalena managed to frighten off the raiders in that case by activating the loud alarm system on our field vehicle. During this period of intervillage raiding from 1986 to 1990, Hiwi men frequently practiced shooting at mock enemy targets and all intervillage visiting ceased. At the same time, there were daily dances that took place with all men in the band holding each other by the arm, forming a single line, and singing songs of solidarity. The final category of killing that we recorded in our sample was what we would call intertribal warfare, killing against people who spoke a different language. We had 133 deaths and 68 individuals captured and presumed dead because they were never seen again. For example, Kanjegi here told me how he and his brother uh, Chachugi had raided a Paraguayan woodcutter's camp in 1969. They shot one logger with an arrow, pinning his two legs together. Then when he couldn't watch, they, they couldn't walk, he approached them, screaming for help, and they cut off his head with an ax to revenge the prior killing of their sister's father-in-law. They then took the ax with them and left. Among the Hiwi, Barda here accounted, told us how her mother Tsibeya had been killed in 1959 with some 30 or more other people in her band that was completely exterminated when surprised by a group of Criollos on the Hikutimeni River. I believe that each one of these categories of killing described implies slightly different evolutionary costs and benefits. In other words, I don't think that lethal violence is a single category of behavior. Stories and anecdotes can give important insights into lethal violence, but statistical analysis is required for systematic comparison. Our demographic data, for example, show that 55% of all pre-contact Ache deaths and 31% of all Hiwi deaths were due to human violence. Interestingly, while only 54% of the victims were male, 96% of the perpetrators were male. Within banned killings classified as infanticide, child homicide, gerontocide, euthanasia, and suicide accounted for more than 40% of this total. I'm going to talk about this again in a second. And intertribal warfare accounted for about 50%. The per capita death rates can be easily calculated by dividing the number of deaths by the population size and the number of years monitored. The pre-contact crude death rate for both the Aceh and the Hiwi is right around 600 deaths per 100,000 person years. 
This is about 100 times higher than the crude death rate in the United States during the 20th century, and at least six times higher than the death rate during the four years of World War II in the United States, counting all homicide and all warfare deaths that took place to US citizens. Notice also the huge drop in violence when both of these two hunter-gather groups first encountered a nation state and were pacified. As evolutionary biologists, we recognize that killing is not uncommon in other species, but I believe there are some unique patterns in human killing. Here today, I'm just going to mention two of these. First, about 40% of all the deaths we recorded were due to infanticide, child homicide, gerontocide, euthanasia, and suicide. Economic studies in hunter-gatherer societies have shown that it does indeed take a village to raise a child. This is what biologists call cooperative breeding. Various kin and non-kin have a vested interest in raising juveniles and also in feeding and caring for each other. Because many individuals help share the costs of raising kids, they may also violently terminate that investment when children are orphaned, defective, or otherwise not likely to be useful. Likewise, individuals who are too old, sick, or injured may not elicit further cooperative provision and care to keep them alive. And finally, probably most shockingly, some individuals choose to terminate their own lives when help they receive from others could better be expended on something else. Most of these types of killings that we're describing here have never been described for any other species of mammals or even vertebrates and are mainly only described among the social insects. The last thing I want to talk about is intertribal warfare. It's a big theme in studying violence in humans because intertribal warfare, first of all, killed 50% of the victims in our database, but most importantly, coalitionary violence is of special interest to evolutionary biologists because all group members sometimes share the benefits of winning a battle, but multiple group members must cooperate at high risk to win. This means there's always a temptation to free ride. In other words, to hang back and let others die for whatever the group beneficial cause is. The cooperative mechanisms that have developed to solve this free rider problem may also apply to other facets of human life as well, possibly explaining why humans are an exceptionally cooperative species with non-kin. So human lethal violence appears to represent a fascinating evolutionary irony. The cruelest human behaviors may turn out to be causally related to some of the most cooperative tendencies of our species. Thank you. Thank you.